Together with Andrew Forrest, Mike Cannon-Brooks has moved on to another renewable energy venture. We're literally sort of sending electrons down a cable from one end to the other. Think of it as a giant extension cable you buy from Bunnings. It's been dubbed the world's biggest renewable energy export project. The company behind it, Sun Cable, is promising to supply cheap renewable energy to Singapore, Darwin and remote Indigenous communities. But a power play between Sun Cable's two highest profile investors has raised questions about the future of the $30 billion project. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, Andrew, for the invitation and um, hope we can, uh, we can make this work. Well, we're going to kill it, mate. Since its beginning in 2018, Sun Cable and its flagship Australia Asia Powerlink project never lacked ambition. It has plans for the world's largest solar farm and biggest battery installation, along with the longest ever undersea cable. The scale of the solar they were building is larger than the entire rooftop solar generation currently in Australia. The batteries they're proposing to build are, are 20 times bigger than the current installed and under construction capacity in Australia. From the centre of Australia, the equivalent of 12,000 rugby pitches worth of solar panels would be erected before being pumped 800 kilometres north to help power Darwin and then journeying another 4,000 kilometres via underwater cables to the small island state. A passage that in parts reaches depths of about two kilometres. The economics of procuring solar energy from uh, Australia is interesting and it all boils down to the cost of that cable. Not to say it can't be accomplished, but it will face very significant competition from solar farms 50 kilometres from Singapore rather than 4,000 kilometres from Singapore. For decades, students. engineering professor Andrew Blakers has been working to advance renewables. He says this advance may be a leap too far. The cable is well beyond uh, state of the art. Um, every component of it is feasible. Putting it all together means that you are pushing boundaries, but when you push boundaries, it is more risky. Last week, with the company needing cash and with Forrest and Cannon Brooks deadlocked over its future, Sun Cable entered voluntary administration. When it went into voluntary administration, I think the view was that was no surprise to anyone in the sector. Matthew Warren headed up the Australian Energy Council and the Clean Energy Council. Such an unprecedented project, he says, was bound to hit choppy waters. It's a start-up, it has no experience in large-scale solar generation, no experience in buying and sourcing big batteries, no experience in undersea transmission, and yet it's proposing to do all three, and it's off the charts. This is way off the map in terms of current electrical undersea transmission engineering. What we've seen in the news has raised some eyebrows, whether such a project is too ambitious, uh, whether it creates risks, whether it would still be able to move forward. I myself am quite optimistic that what we see is a hurdle. The small, highly developed nation of Singapore lacks natural resources of its own, or enough land to deploy onshore solar or wind. That leaves it, for now, reliant on imported gas for electricity production, although it has pledged to become carbon neutral. Singapore uh, would be able to benefit greatly in terms of having a direct connection through to Australia, since Australia does have the potential to send a large amount of green electrons through this cable. David Broadstock works for the Energy Studies Institute at the National University of Singapore. And this is something that Singapore wants to see move forward. And Australia is a very reliable uh, partner to the Singapore economy historically. Mike Cannon Brooks's investment firm said Sun Cable went into administration after all but one shareholder agreed with the company's funding strategy, suggesting it wanted to stay with Sun Cable with constructive partners. Clearly, there is a 
difference in opinion as to the direction that the company should proceed, whether it is sending solar to Singapore or solar to Southern Australia, or sending solar to electrolyzers to produce large amounts of, of, of green hydrogen for export for the chemical industry around the world. Andrew Forrest's company says Sun Cable's Australia Asia Powerlink project is not commercially viable, but it continues to believe in the vision for a game changing solar and battery project, perhaps to produce green hydrogen and green ammonia for industrial use. With construction supposed to start next year, bringing hundreds of jobs to the Northern Territory, the government there remains hopeful. At the moment, we're really uh, looking to Sun Cable to resolve this shareholder matter as swiftly as possible. Uh, we are very heartened by uh, the assurances we have been given about their confidence of resolving this voluntary administration process as swiftly as possible so we can continue moving forward with this project, which is going to be great for the Northern Territory. While questions remain over the viability of powering Asia from Australia, there are hopes the project will proceed in some form. Energy security and energy resilience is more valuable than ever. Well, I think there'll be a year or two of repositioning and then a decision will have to be made by the administrators in conjunction with the major shareholders as to what the future focus of the company will be.